Welcome to the Stanford Health Policy Forum. I'm Dan Kessler. I'm a professor in the business and law schools here at Stanford and a member of the Advisory Council of the Stanford Health Policy Forum. That's uh, why I'm here today. Uh, I'd like to make a, just a couple of brief opening remarks and then introduce our panelists. Uh, first, most important, please turn off your cell phones and pagers, put them on silence mode. Uh, second, uh, Gary's books are for sale out front. Uh, along with some complimentary uh, publications from uh, Chris Gardner, who I'll introduce uh, also in a moment. And uh, third, uh, you can see all of our events, this one included, uh, on the web, filmed uh, at healthpolicyforum.stanford.edu. But before I introduce um, our panelists, I'd like to just take a moment to uh, thank uh, Dean Pizzo, Phil Pizzo here, uh, for his leadership and commitment to our Stanford Health Policy Forum. Um, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a member of the advisory board. I'm saying this as a member of the Stanford community and someone who's really enjoyed uh, coming to these things. Uh, we've covered a wide array of topics of uh, broad importance to health policy. And I think it's been a wonderful service to the university and to the community as a whole. So that I'd like to thank you, Phil. It's been a lot of fun. Um, now let me just move right to uh, introducing our speakers today. First is uh, Gary Taubes. Uh, Gary is a science journalist, the author and co-founder, an author and co-founder of the Nutrition Science Initiative. Uh, his two books, of which I own multiple copies, and uh, suggest you guys do too: uh, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, and Good Calories, Bad Calories. He's also a contributing correspondent for Science and the recipient of a Robert Wood Johnson uh, Independent Investigator Award in Health Policy. Uh, he's won numerous awards for his journalism, including the International Health Reporting Award uh, from the, uh, and the National Association of Science Writers in Society Journalism Award uh, three times, the only print journalist ever to do so. He's also the co-founder, as I said, of the nonprofit Nutrition Science Initiative. Taubes uh, has argued uh, and will today uh, explain to us uh, how our diet's overemphasis on certain kinds of foods, carbohydrates, uh, has led directly to the obesity epidemic that we're facing. Uh, with us also today is uh, Chris Gardner. Chris is an associate professor of medicine and director of the nutrition studies uh, at the Stanford Prevention Research Center. He serves on the nutrition committee of the American Heart Association and the education committee of the Obesity Society. Chris is actively involved in research focused on dietary intervention trials designed to test the effects of food components and food uh, eating patterns on chronic disease factors, including body weight, lipids, and inflammatory markers. And uh, moderating our discussion today is Paul Costello. Paul is the chief communications officer for the uh, Stanford University Medical School. He leads the medical school's communication and public relations efforts and will be uh, serving as the, as the ringleader from now on. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Paul. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I want to begin by asking you, how many of you have ever been on a diet? <laughs> OK. How many have been on a low-fat diet? And how many have been on a low-carb diet? OK. I want to begin by asking the two people here on stage, what did you have for Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> and how, what does what you had for Thanksgiving dinner tell us about your beliefs about food and nutrition? Uh, or what does it tell us about my family's beliefs? Uh, uh, either way. Children's beliefs? Yeah, well, if you can't control your family, that's another issue. But uh, um, what does it tell us about food that you chose? Well, okay, so what we have is what everyone has. What yeah. I actually put on my plate yep. um, was mostly, yeah, turkey and uh, some, and uh, green beans and Brussels sprouts and, uh, yeah, I had a little dessert, a little <laughs> bit of sweet potatoes, and my wife insisted I try the mashed potatoes. Um, the stuffing didn't look that appetizing, I have to say, so had it looked better, I'd have had a little. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Thanksgiving's a lousy example for what it says about uh, my nutritional beliefs, but I do, you know, I, I obviously believe that the, it's the sort of the carbohydrate content of the diet that's problematic. 
um, and for reasons I hope to explain tonight. And so the less, least, less starch I eat, the less refined grains and sugar, the better I feel and the lighter I am. And uh, I think this is possibly a universal phenomena, which we'll also talk about. Mm -hmm. Christopher. Well, I'm not everyone, because that's not what I had. So, and, and I love the part about the family. The family is enormous in this. So my father-in-law has a history of heart disease in his family. He's been a vegetarian for years. I've been a vegetarian for 30 years. We had a little bit of duck for the mother-in-law. Uh, but the rest of us, uh, what I made was Jesse Cool's butternut squash soup in a vegetable broth with figs and pine nuts and white wine and a splash of maple syrup. I also baked up some acorn squash, and I put an onion, four-color red bell pepper mixture on top that was sauteed and mixed with a little rice and apples and raisins. Uh, Grant yeah, I'm going to interrupt for one second here. If, if my wife had her way, we would be eating at his house next Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's a given. So, and part of that that I want to emphasize is I cook. Uh, and I think that's a big issue that we have to deal with today. My father-in-law cooked this amazing green bean dish with pearl onions, and they made a, a fabulous salad that has everything and the kitchen sink on the salad. So it's not just a green leaf lettuce salad. It's a work of art. You know, interesting that, that one of the things that I've just heard you both say is you can eat well, eat, eat well and, and do it within a confines of you know, not feeling that you're abstaining or not feeling that you're restraining, and that you can also have a day or a week or a, or a moment that you celebrate something very different than keeping yourself restrained from food. Is that right? Is that basically the way you approach food? Well, yeah, in general, but I also think that everybody's different. So you could make the argument, for instance, that on this day of thanks, we could have all had a few cigarettes, and we could have all had a few drinks, um, and that would be true for many of us, and not true for some of us who are more less tolerant of these, and perhaps for whom these foods are more these substances are more addictive. So I think one of the mistakes we make is that there's a spectrum of assuming that. You know, again, something I hope we talk about, that a, a calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie, and these foods have different metabolic, hormonal, and uh, cognitive effects, then there's a spectrum, a, 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 maybe a bell-shaped curve of how we respond to them. And most of us can do exactly what you said, but some of us might be better off if they don't. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of questions that haven't been answered. What are the biggest misconceptions and, uh, that, that Americans, particularly Americans, have about food, diet, and nutrition today? Christopher? Uh, well, they think a lot of food-like substances are food, and they're not really. <laughs> they're uh, packaged, processed manipulation. So that would be the biggest food what, misconception. What does that mean? It, so we've taken what was food, and we've packaged it and brought added value to it. So the farmers out there growing stuff and getting six cents on the dollar for it, and the middle people took it and added fat and sugar and coloring and a label on the front of the package that says it's got this and it's absolutely fabulous despite all the other junk that we put in it and you should buy it for the fabulous thing that we put in it. So that would be my comment on the food-like substance. Uh, the weight, uh, I'm not sure if people have misconceptions. It, we have really interesting studies where people look at different shapes of body and you ask them what's normal and culturally it's very different. What's a normal body size? What's acceptable? Uh, and then what was the last one? Food, weight, and... Generally the misconception about food, weight, and diets. And diets in general. Well, yeah, so the term diet actually means whatever diet you're on. Weight loss diet, weight gain diet, habitual diet. I think the American public scene thinks diet is a time of deprivation and a time of change that you will soon go off. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst part about it. How many of you agree with that? Diets is something you do and then you go off of. Oh, you're so educated. Thank you. <laughs> we always get over-educated people at these. So it's America's misconception, but not yours. Thank you. What about you, Gary? What are, what are the biggest misconceptions about food, diet, and um, weight? Well, I've paid more attention to what the research community and the public health authorities have been telling us. I don't know if how many of us agree, 
Um, to me, the greatest misconception out there is that the reason we get fat is because of this idea that we just take in more calories than we expend. If you read the literature, you'll see this phrase all the time that obesity is an energy balance disorder. It's as though it's a thermodynamics or a physics issue. And um, I think that's just, that is kind of the original sin in obesity research and nutrition. And so everything we've done since then that was embraced in the 1950s in the United States. Everything we've done since then has been misconceived in effect because it's been based on this idea. So when you go on a diet, the primary thing you want to do on the diet is eat less. Or if you're too heavy, you want to exercise more and eat less. And some combination of manipulating your energy intake and output in a way that you go into what we call negative energy balance and now you're losing weight. And by the same token, you know, this idea that when you get down to the weight you like, you can now just move into energy balance and stay that weight, although nobody really understands what that means, but that also feeds into this idea that we go on diets, we lose a certain amount of weight, and then we could go back to eating the way either we used to eat or the way other people around us seem to eat to maintain their weights, and we end up you know, going on and off diets our whole lives in part because this concept is simply misconceived. You, you pretty much attacked the Department of Agriculture food pyramid. Would you say that's fair? Uh, it's one of the, the institutions I pretty much attacked. Yeah. Why? What's wrong with the food? Um, I mean, the major issue is, you know, until the 1960s, the conventional wisdom were that carbohydrate-rich foods had some characteristic that we call fattening. So bread, pasta, potatoes, grains of any kind, anything from flour, um, sweets, had this magical quality of being fattening. Um, and so we avoided them. And then in the 1960s, we began to embrace the idea that dietary fat causes heart disease, because heart disease and obesity are so intimately associated. You can't tell people to lower fat and eat more carbohydrates if carbohydrates are going to be fattening. So dietary fat had to become fattening as well. And between the 60s and the 90s, when the Food Guide Pyramid was instituted, we took this concept of the fattening carbohydrate and turned it into the heart-healthy carbohydrate as diet food. So by the late 1980s, all of I remember when baked potatoes became a diet food in my life. And suddenly, we were all eating baked potatoes every night because the idea was it was the sour cream and the butter that was really fattening, and the potato was, you know, not, was somehow a diet food, whereas in the 1960s, my mother would have believed that a baked potato was fattening. Mm -hmm. And all of this would be meaningless, wouldn't be a problem with the food pyramid if it was correct, this transition. But again, the argument I've been making is that, and it's taken, you know, it's not my argument that I've, that, that's in my books, is that, these carbohydrate-rich foods really are fattening, that they do have this characteristic of being fattening, and we should know why that is, because of their effect on the hormone that regulates fat accumulation. And so what we ended up doing was embracing, you know, building a food pyramid where we were all supposed to eat fattening foods as a staple of our diet, those exact foods that my mother's generation, and like no French woman of a certain age would ever be seen eating, mm -hmm. um, are the foods we're supposed to eat all the time, and then we can't, and they're heart healthy. So if we get off them, our doctor tells us we're going to give ourselves a heart attack. And we have a serious problem. And all of this coincides with an obesity and diabetes epidemic. What about the food pyramid? I mean, it's the Department of Agriculture, U.S. government. It's, it was tested, I'm sure. They're, they didn't come up with it out of you know, thin air. What about the... If you go into it historically, it was tested less than you would believe. Testing mm -hmm. it requires long follow-up of people and randomization to prove cause and effect. And, and it was a lot of common sense that was built into it. And I would suggest a lot of it that came into the fat vilification <laughs> had to do with some earlier trials that tried to look at diet and decided, boy, you know, waiting for somebody to live or die, get cancer, heart disease, whew, that's going to blow the whole NIH budget. I tell you what, let's go for something like lowering blood cholesterol, which we know from drug trials has been shown to save lives, and saturated fat raises the bad cholesterol. And that was a proxy for this. So if you were on a high fat diet and it was high saturated fat, you raised your LDL, and that should have been bad. So what was the counter to that? It would have been carbs. You would have lowered your fat, and you have to replace it with something, so you replaced it with carbs. But it's seriously a, a case of 
perhaps good intentions, no, certainly good intentions, gone awry uh, because of what the food industry did with that health message. So some of my favorite examples are low-fat organic yogurt. I mean, what could be more heartwarming than low-fat? Or can I ask, who's had low-fat organic yogurt in the last week? Now, how many of you had plain, and how many of you had raspberry or peach or apricot or raspberry peach apricot? Because the raspberry peach apricot has almost no fruit in it. It's got some sweetener before the berry. It's not, it doesn't even have enough berry to color the yogurt. So they add coloring and flavor and sugar and then the berry. And you've got a low fat product. But it's yogurt. High it, how could it be bad? <laughs> because it's full of sugar. So what happened is when we pushed this low fat thing, we made a lot of foods that technically were low fat. But when they took the fat out, the mouth taste was gone, the feel was gone, and they replaced it with various forms of sugar, high fructose corn syrup being the worst offender. Not any worse than sugar, but cheaper. So easier to add and slip into almost everything. So, I mean, food companies are there to make money. So they test, pan they use test panels to see what people like. Oh, the fat was gone, you don't like it as much. How about if we put a little more sugar, a little more sugar? Ah, got that, okay, so now we can do the low fat version and what we ended up with was a lot of simple carbohydrates that are quickly absorbed and have done us in. I want to get to sugar in a, in a little bit, but I want to go back to something you've written about in your book, Gary, is that we really began this, this obesity surge in the late 80s or in the 80s. What happened in the 80s that this it was, it, was it portions became larger? Was it the addition of, the, of sugar into everything? Was it additives? What happened at the end? Well, this is what actually got me into this research. But um, I, I started actually around 2001 when I pitched an article to the New York Times, which was what caused the obesity epidemic. Because back then it was new. And I had done a, a year-long investigation for the journal Science on the dietary fat beliefs and I knew two things had changed in the, the, the 1980s, or from 1977 to 1984. And we could localize the beginning of the obesity epidemic between two national health uh, examination, NHANES, National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys. And <clears throat> so sometime between the late 1970s and the very early 1990s. And in that time period, but well, we introduced high fructose corn syrup in 1977. And by 1984, it had pretty much taken over the soft drink market. It had replaced sugar, sucrose, in Coke and Pepsi. And then we instituted this low fat diet is a healthy diet dogma. That process was institutionalized beginning in 1977 by a Senate committee run by George McGovern. And then by 1984, the National Institutes of Health had had a uh, consensus conference um, declaring that the entire country over the age of two should be on a low fat diet. And Time Magazine ran this very famous cover, which was a dinner plate with, or a breakfast plate with two fried eggs as the eyes and a piece of bacon for the frowning mouth. And it was cholesterol and now the bad news. And I was working at Time Inc. at the time, and I remember that cover and how our diets literally changed from that day. So the two sort of um, prime suspects would be this introduction of high fructose corn syrup and then this belief, like I said, that a low-fat diet where you replace the fat with carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates is a healthy diet. And when we brought in high fructose corn syrup, as Chris said, there is some evidence that it's a little bit worse than sugar, maybe 10% worse. If you assume that sugar is bad, high fructose corn syrup is maybe maybe 10% worse or 5% worse, and some evidence may or may not be true. Um, but we didn't know high fructose corn syrup was sugar. And actually, the corn refiners, I find this very amusing, because the corn refiners went out of their way to present it. They would refer to it as fructose to differentiate it from sucrose. And then they would, would, would refer to fructose as a naturally occurring fruit sugar. And sucrose is a 50-50. It's a molecule of glucose bonded to a molecule of fructose, so it's a 50-50 mixture. And high fructose corn syrup, as we were consuming it in soft drinks and teas, was 55 fructose, 45 glucose. So they're effectively identical. But what you see in the, the food availability data is the consumption of all caloric sweeteners 
which is about 95% uh, sucrose and high fructose corn syrup starts turning upward in the 1980s. And my contention is it's just because we didn't know that high fructose corn syrup was sugar, so that the primary ingredients in whatever we were drinking didn't have to say sugar and water. They could have this sort of naturally occurring fruit sugar. And sugar consumption, then caloric sweetener consumption climbed steadily to the end of the the century, and then it starts to turn over around 1999, 2000. And again, that pretty much parallels the obesity epidemic. But it, it's very hard to make sense of this kind of observational data, because a lot of other things also change. Yeah, to chime in, so the, the data set that Gary's referring to, this uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, has been done over time. And there may be some methodological issues, but if you track calories over time, they were fairly stable, and then they jumped in 1980 by about two or 300 calories in men and women. And then they were stable again. And I happen to really like Marion Nessel's take on this, which um, doesn't contrast it yours at all. It just complements it. And it has to do- Who's Marion Nessel? Marion Nessel uh, is at New York University. She's written a book called Food Politics. She's written uh, What We Eat. She's got a great new book. Have you seen the calorie book? <laughs> Oh, I guess you don't like it. Okay, I like your great new book. <laughs> Not that I don't like it. Julie really walks wrong. you step by step through a lot of things. <laughs> so to complement what Gary said, it's fascinating. Whoever was head of General Electric in 1981, and I'm going to blank on it. I think it's James Welch, came up with the Jack idea. Welch. Is that it? Jack Welch. Jack Welch came up with the idea of shareholder value and started this movement that you can't just have profit from year to year, and not even year to year, quarter to quarter, you need to show, show growth. And that was about the time that people started supersizing things. And so that was part of, and I think what they were super, supersizing with, which fits with your discussion, is more sugary packaged processed food. So, I mean, to say don't eat so much sugar won't work if Wall Street is totally geared up to supersize and show growing profits on a quarterly basis to investors, which I, th I think is part of the complexity that underlies this. How much of this low-fat mantra that we've been consumed with and obsessed with since the 80s, 90s, how much of that is responsible for obesity today? Well, this is one of the interesting points I would like to make. Um, I, you could argue a lot of it. You, know, you could see in the data that we did embrace this, these dietary beliefs to some extent. So industry is putting more and more sugar, refined grains, processed food out there, while simultaneously we are eating healthier, as the USDA is telling us to eat. So we're lowering our fat consumption a little. Red meat consumption comes down significantly. Sugar consumption goes up significantly. But something I point out in my books that I think is crucial is <clears throat> You can find populations with high levels of obesity, as, as, as high as we have in the United States today, that had none of this toxic food environment on which we kind of want to blame our obesity problem. So beginning with the Pima Indians and the Native American tribe, the Pima in 1902, a Harvard anthropologist comes to visit this, this, this uh, population on, on their reservation south of Phoenix in 1902 and comments that all the older women seem to be obese. Um, and they'd just gone through a 20-year period of famine, which is, you could think of as like 20 years on a very low-calorie diet. And yet, and there's a photo in the book that was published in 1906 of a fat Pima woman that he calls Fat Louisa. 1928, a couple of University of Chicago economists studied the Sioux on the Crow Creek Reservation in South Dakota, and they, they, they described the unbelievable, almost unimaginable poverty on this reservation, and yet they point out that a quarter of the women are what they call distinctly fat. While there are obviously children who are starving and not getting enough food, and this is an observation that you see um, throughout history in the 50s and the 60s and Central um, Caribbean island uh, populations and African populations and South Pacific Islanders, um, and what's called the double, <coughs> double burden of obesity and malnutrition. There was recently a paper published of uh, Western Sahara refugees and Algerian refugee camps, right? If I remember the numbers correctly, 25% of the families had obese mothers and starving children. And they don't have this toxic food environment that we have. There's something obviously toxic about their environment. That's the issue. 
but they don't have McDonald's or Burger Kings or the processed food we're talking about. They had some processed food. And so the question is, why were those populations fat? Because we can now start ruling out. Well, what did we know? Why are they fat? Well, the two things, as far as I can tell, they all have in common is, uh, and something is true of virtually all impoverished populations, you live on a carbohydrate-rich diet. Sugar is a primary. Rice. Is, is, right, although you have Southeast Asians who mm -hmm. live on carb-rich diets with a lot of rice who are not obese and not diabetic. So the, then you could ask the question, what's the difference between the Southeast Asian populations and these other populations I've been describing, like Trinidadian women in the early 19th, Trinidad in the early 1960s is having a malnutrition crisis. The US government sends a team of nutritionists down to help out, and they come back saying, look, the, the people have, you know, this, uh, 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 vitamin deficiency diseases are rife. You can see all these signs of malnutrition, and yet obesity is an, a, quote, explosive medical problem. And the next year, an MIT nutritionist comes back and reports that the average diet is less than 2,000 calories, 21% fat. So you can ask, what's the difference between that population and the Southeast Asians and the sugar in the diet? Sugar is usually relatively new to the diet as a population. Um, you have the Sioux, the Native American Sioux would not have had either refined flour or sugar until the mid 19th century. And then, um, you know, so that's a kind of, again, the, the prime suspect for what's driving obesity in these populations. So you could have an extremely poor population eating a carbohydrate rich diet with refined grains and sugars. And that's enough to cause obesity, even if there's not enough calories to constitute any degree of gluttony, as we would describe it. You raised the <laughs> issue of heredity. And I wondered if you could both talk about heredity and genetics, what we know about the different populations, which you said in Asia, they are carbohydrate rich, rice is an example, but relatively thin. What do we know so far in terms of science, heredity, food, and obesity? So you can look at different populations, which will never be cause and effect. So there are a lot of other differences that go on. I mean, interestingly, to cherry pick some populations, the New York Times just had that, um, the longevity group in the island of Icaria. I see they quoted you a little bit. They asked you what you thought, because it's a very plant-based diet. But they live to 100. They also sleep till 11 every day. Then they work for a while. Then they take an afternoon nap. And then they all get together for a really small dinner. <clears throat> the Tarahumara Indians uh, survive almost all on corn and beans, but they're ultramarathoners. Hmm. Phil would know about the ultramarathoners. So there is some genetic predisposition. You could look from population to population. That's why it's valuable to look at Pacific Islanders or South Asians. Claude Bouchard did this amazing study. Uh, in 1990, he got 15 monozygotic twins, and he overfed them a thousand calories a day for something like 80 days. Now, it, if, the, if that math had worked out, regardless of what size you were, that excess, excessive caloric intake should have been about eight kilos of added weight by the time you were done. So among the monozygotic twins, there was a significant correlation. There were differences between groups of twins, but within twins, it was smaller than between different groups of twins. But interestingly, one of the twins gained four kilos and one gained eight in one pair. One gained six and one gained 12. In the whole group of 30 individuals, one gained four kilos and one gained 13 kilos with the same thousand calories. So there's clearly some genetics there and it's clearly not entirely genetics. So uh, this is a, uh, uh, I don't know, let's ask Gary. <laughs> well, no, this is as early as the 1930s, German-Austrian research had established that obesity has a huge genetic component. I and mean, we all know this. It, you know, identical twins don't just have the same faces, they have the same bodies. Um, obesity runs in families, although there have been arguments over the years that it runs in families because some parents just like to cook too much food and everybody in the family eats too much food and other parents don't, so you could argue that one way or the other, but it's always been uh, well known that this is a huge genetic component. And the quick question is the genes um, are obviously being triggered by something in the environment because we know we have populations where there is simply not a lot of obesity. And one of the observations that was made beginning in the 1960s 
um, is that you have populations that emigrate from what, for instance, in the 1930s, 1940s, obesity was virtually unknown in Africa. And yet, physicians who worked in African hospitals would come to the United States for a year and work in an inner city. One example was a South uh, uh, African named George Campbell who came to work in Philadelphia for a year, and he was stunned. I mean, he ran a diabetes clinic in South Africa where he had virtually zero case of diabetes in the black African population. And then he gets to Philadelphia, and the hospitals are full of diabetic, you know, African Americans are only 300 years or 200 years removed from Africa. So what's the difference? What's triggering this obese, what you could call the obese and diabetic phenotype mm -hmm. in the environment? And the obesity epidemic is another example, because the 30 or 40 years that the epidemic has been happening is too short to have been any significant genetic changes. There could have been epigenetic issues, um, changes in, the, uh, in utero that suddenly tipped. There are ways to explain it without evoking a new factor in the environment, but the most likely thing is something in the environment changed and triggers obesity and type 2 diabetes in a greater proportion of the population. I wonder if one way to ask a question about obesity and is that it's so easy to get fat and obese and overweight, especially as one moves into middle age. Perhaps the better question is, why are some people slim? Yes, that is a great question. I mean, if you look at what it would take to put on pounds, uh, let's try some simple math here. These numbers don't actually work if you do this in real life, but they say 3,500 calories is the equivalent of a pound of fat. So if you eat in excess of 3,500 calories, you would gain a pound. There's 365 days in the year. If you had 10 extra calories a day for a year, that would be a pound times 20 years is 20 pounds. That's all it would take, it's 10 extra calories a day. It's off by at least a factor of two. I know you have a chapter that's 20 calories. So let's use that, 20 calories a day if you can imagine how many M&Ms that is, it's only a few M&Ms, and it's probably one or two chips a day. C couldn't, I mean, couldn't you just have that many fewer chips? That just seems insane. The challenge in all this is most of us, our daily caloric intake shifts from day to day by hundreds of calories, sometimes a thousand calories from one day to the other. I would think that people might find that hard. So to explain that more, how does it shift so dramatically? Uh, you woke up late, you skipped breakfast, you ran to work, you thought there was going to be something offered, there wasn't, and then the next day, after having an enormous breakfast and a good-sized lunch, you walked in, there was a surprise party for you, and you had cake, and after your surprise party, your office mate had a surprise party, <laughs> and you had to have another piece of cake, just to be polite, and mm. at the end of the day, you've eaten a thousand calories differently than you did the day before, so it, what's amazing is that people are slim. There is food everywhere, all the time now. And how do some people, if you, if you do the math, it's roughly a million calories a year that you eat. And if you're, in theory, off by 3,500, one way or the other, you gain or lose a pound. How do you do that? I mean, you're not even being conscious of this. And most of you maintain a fairly stable weight. So you're right. What's more amazing is that more of us aren't overweight, given the ubiquitous availability of food now. Well, let's. <coughs> Um, to use the example you used, Claude Bouchard's study. Um, so here was a population where they, you know, again, they measured their energy expenditure and then they forced them to eat 1,000 calories more a day. And yet some of them still remained relatively lean and some didn't. There was a wide variation in how much weight they gained even when they were going having the two surprise birthday parties a day. So the question is, one way you could ask that question is what's the difference between the ones who only gained four pounds, I don't remember that, and then the ones who gained 20 pounds. Kilos. On the same amount of excess eating. Now these studies are flawed to begin with because they assume that the way people get fat is by eating too much. So they feed them too much, and that's not necessarily true. But you could see that even under those circumstances, some people have the ability to, let's say, upregulate for at least the length of the study their energy expenditure. Maybe they even feel more physically active. There used to be this concept of the impulse to physical activity. So maybe some of the twins thought, I've got to go for a run 
You know, man, it could have been behavioral, it could have been psychological. Some of them just thought, I'm not gaining all this weight, I don't care how much they, I'm going for a run even though I feel like taking a nap, like my twin brother. Um, but there are all these, you know, there's what you want to know. Why is it that some of them, when force fed, gain only a little bit of weight? Because we could assume those are the ones who are going to stay lean when they're not force fed. Mm -hmm. And the others gain so much weight. Their fat is just going to inflate to embrace these calories. You wrote a piece for the New York Times Magazine not long ago that I would say was pretty controversial. And uh, it's based on the U UCSF researcher Robert Lustig's work. And it charged that sugar is toxic. And um, I wondered if you could, first of all, what does it mean that sugar is to toxic? And what do we do about it? I mean, what do, do we regulate it? Do we have, is Mayor Bloomberg a hero of yours who is really setting <laughs> policy in place to control what we drink? What, what do we do knowing the implications, the health implications, and that, that uh, sugar is such a significant tr contributor to obesity? I'm actually going to start with the easy question. I, Mayor Bloomberg is not a hero of mine, but I do wish he would move to Oakland, <laughs> run for mayor, and then ban juice boxes at birthday parties. That's like my, one of my primary fantasies in life. Um, <laughs> the, works I know. It's, yeah. Um, he has we won't even go there. We go to yeah. birthday parties. Um, the, the article actually didn't, wasn't based on Dr. Uh, Ludwig's uh, Rob uh, Lustig's work, it, it did use him as the lead of the article because Rob Lustig at UCSF has really put himself out there attacking sugar in the diet and making this argument that sugar is toxic. And so I got to use uh, Rob to as kind of launch into this argument that's been around for arguably maybe 130, 140 years that there's something unique about the way we metabolize sugar that's uniquely deleterious to our body. So the way Rob Lustig does describe, and I like it, he says, you know, 100 calories of sugar are metabolized entirely differently than 100 calories of the glucose from starch or the fat or protein from uh, some other food. And so something can be isocaloric. It could be the same amount of calories, but have a different, be metabolized differently, and so have a different hormonal response in your body and create a different hormonal sort of enzymatic milieu in the body that could be deleterious. It could lead to the chronic diseases we suffer from today. And one of the fundamental observations on which my books are built is that there's a kind of a cluster of chronic diseases that are common in Western populations eating Western diets and eating Western lifestyles. These are obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, possibly including Alzheimer's. And so you see these pop, you see these diseases in westernized populations. And at least from the uh, mid to late 19th century through the Second World War, when the world, the British colonial and missionary physicians had spread around the world and were running hospitals all around the world, you didn't see these diseases in the isolated populations, whether they were the marathon runners in the Mexican hills or uh, pastoralists like the Maasai that were living on you know, the blood, milk, and meat from the cattle they raised or the Inuit or you know, any baseline population simply didn't seem to have these diseases. And then when Western foods became available or when these populations moved into urban centers and began eating Western diets, you started to see these diseases. And when you say so, Western diets, are you significantly, is the major contributing factor there sugar and fructose? Well, is and that, this is the question. What is it about the Western lifestyle? Right. So this is not a very controversial idea, although it's embraced a little more by some than others. I embrace it and I built it, you know, and affect these books on it. So what is it about the Western lifestyle? If you don't like, you know, if you think we're all too sedentary and you're a marathon runner, you blame it on sedentary behavior is one of the problems. It could be the vegetable oils. It could be the refined grains and sugars. It could be that we just eat too much. It could be that, you know, you could, again, it's one of these observations that it's bounded only by your imagination. Again, the simplest possible hypothesis, I would argue, and it's backed up by what we've learned about uh, metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, a lot of work done by 
Gerald Reeven here at Stanford, is that it is indeed the sugar and refined grains that are the problems. And so, um, and then you have these obesity and diabetes epidemics, as we've talked about. One of the things I pointed out in this Is Sugar Toxic piece in the New York Times Magazine is there was a diabetes epidemic that followed the Civil War in the United States. And from the 1870s through the 1920s, um, diabetes rates skyrocketed. They went up 10, 15 fold in some American cities. And in fact, I got the data for a book I'm supposed to be writing on sugar and high fructose corn syrup. I got the inpatient data from Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia from 18, and they had years in the 1870s where they had zero cases of diabetes, which is unimaginable today. Um, now, a lot of the increase is due to diagnostic factors, life insurance came in, suddenly middle-aged men who were prone to diabetes were getting checked for it. Uh, a test to measure blood sugar and sugar in the urine came in, so it used to be that the physician's assistant had to taste the urine. And so you could imagine there are a lot of reasons diabetes would be diagnosed, but the numbers were so large that as late as the 1920s, that people were arguing that leading uh, public health authority at Columbia University was saying, look, sugar is the culprit. It should be the prime culprit. And this argument was made over and over and over again that we would not have type 2 diabetes if we didn't have significant amounts of sugar in the diet. So Christopher, do you agree? Is sugar toxic? Sure. Yes, in the amount that we eat right now, yeah, we should cut down. And what does amazing. toxicity mean? What is toxicity it, what do you means use that term? The, the half that's fructose and the amount that we eat it goes specifically to the liver. It doesn't go to the bloodstream. The liver clears it. In excess amounts, you get fatty liver disease, which mirrors alcoholism and contributes to this insulin resistance that we're probably going to get into a little more as part of this debate. And in the amounts we eat it, it's deleterious to our health. Almost impossible to separate out if the sugar board were on the stage with us, from calories. You're eating too many, it's not the sugar, it's the calories. Oh, okay, well I cut back on the sugar. Well then you cut back on the calories, add something back. No, no, then you're, so you get stuck in these arguments. Anytime you change one thing in diet, you have to change something else at the same time, which is my fear in some of what Gary is promoting in terms of shifting everybody from fat to carbs. So I agree the low-fat message had unintended consequences. And if I can go back to that just for a minute so that I can work my way back to carbs, the bottom of the food pyramid is bread, cereals, rice, and pasta, right? Those are the four groups. Well, most Americans just eat bread, and they just eat white bread. And the uh, health professionals forever have been promoting whole grains. For a lot of people, that means I'm going to switch from white wonder bread to whole wheat flour bread, which is not a whole grain. That's a highly refined grain. It's pulverized into flour. It gets absorbed like that. It has the same glycemic index, which is how fast the glucose ends up in your blood, as white bread does. The whole grain is wheat berry. I'm guessing almost everybody in this room has had a serving of bread in the last week, and I'm guessing a small proportion of you have had wheat berries. Wheat berries are the whole grain. So if we were to take the bottom part of the food pyramid and eat whole grains, it might be a different story. But we've been eating lots and lots of bread. Or we've been taking pasta, which could have been the base of something. We have this massive thing of pasta and a little sauce on top. Or we have a big tortilla and a little bit of cheese on top. Uh, I mean, the base of a lot of those meals, it was like holding the meal. But too much of it okay. was holding the meal. Just to remind you, remember I talked about populations that had high levels of obesity and did not have huge platters of pasta and did not have, you know, huge tortillas. So this whole concept of eating too much is actually tautological. It's fascinating. You know you eat too much if you're too fat, right? Michael Phelps can eat three times as much as any of us, but he's not eating too much because he's perfectly lean. So the question is, if you can have obese populations without too much, without the amount of sugar that we eat today. For instance, the Pima in 1902 would have been eating about 5 to 10 pounds of sugar per year per capita maximum. Actually, one of the uh, articles I found in my research was a, a 
a doctor in 1715 in the United Kingdom in an article, it's called The Vindication of Sugar, and people had been attacking sugar as a noxious part of the British diet, and in 1715, this British doctor takes it upon himself to say sugar is perfectly healthy. He says, just as healthy as tobacco and alcohol. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then he says, in 1715, when the per capita consumption of sugar in the UK was probably five to 10 pounds per year, or say 1 20th of what we're eating today, or 1 40th, then he says, but it makes young women fat. So the question is, what does too much mean? And if you are getting fat, then whatever the amount you're eating is too much. Let me ask one question just in a, how many of you in the, you know, we asked how many have been on a diet, how many of you in here are actually happy with your weight? Okay, and how many of you make a real effort to eat, this is Palo Alto and Stanford, how many of you make a real effort to eat healthy? Okay, so how many of you eat that platter of spaghetti and the huge, you know, the junk? There's, there's, a, there's a disassociation between how people think, they do think they're eating healthy, and yet they're overweight and or obese anyway. So the question is, what's happened? What's what, what, what has, what, uh, you want to get in there, Christopher? Well, yeah, I got interrupted. I get to go back and finish my story. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead. sorry. The problem was that we vilified fat and it, we tried to simplify the public health message, and it had unintended consequences. We ate from the bottom of the pyramid in ways that people didn't anticipate. I think the, the signers of the food pyramid wanted us to eat more leafy greens and acorn squash with that wonderful onion four color red bell pepper thing that I put on top of it. And instead, they ate white bread. So we can shift it now. And this would be a, a really, I think, exciting discussion to get in between the two of us, because we agree on some level and we differ, disagree on others about a calorie is a calorie. So if it's really the carbs and if it's really the sugar, then we should shift gears, get out of the low fat, and go to low carb, and we'll be all set. And the problem with that, Gary, is I've got a study going on right now. I randomized 60 people to go lowest fat humanly possible lowest carb humanly possible. Six months later, the average weight loss is 20 pounds in both groups. In both groups, somebody lost zero and somebody lost 50. And it's an absolute continuum in both groups. So the issue is, if you just say low carb or low fat, what you're missing out on is the amazing heterogeneity that's but this is part of your metabolism, everyone out there. So if we, I think insulin resistance and carbs is a big issue for a proportion of the population. And if you oversimplify it and exaggerate it too much, you're going to get people mad at us again that, oh, they said low fat and now they said low carb and that doesn't work either. So I'm going to eat whatever I want. I give up. <laughs> Okay, it's actually interesting because one of the arguments you, I've heard since 2002 when I first wrote this very controversial New York Times Magazine article is, um, and you're not making this, but I understand the argument, is that um, we all must agree because otherwise we're going to get this anarchy and everyone's going to give up. The argument I'm making isn't that we should all eat high-fat diets, isn't that, you know, and the, the, the question is, what fundamentally causes obesity and type 2 diabetes? We, as we said, we know that it's triggered by the environment. So what is it? We can figure this is a scientific issue. I mean, this is a scientific institution. That can be established. And yeah, everybody responds. Whatever it is, there are people who are going to respond differently. But it's pretty clear that this has been triggered by something in the environment. And what I'm arguing is the sugar and the refined grains, the high glycemic index grains, and I would argue on both your diets, the low fat and the very low fat and the very low carb, they're probably avoiding mm -hmm. the high glycemic index carbohydrates and sugars. So the question is, you know, is that why their both groups are getting healthier? Or is it because something about maybe dietary fat is bad for somebody? Maybe for some of us, maybe there's, you know, there's arguments that vegetable oils, polyunsaturated fats could be a problem, omega-6 fatty acids could be triggering it. But the fundamental issue here is that it is a, something is triggering this problem. 
But how do yeah. people dig through this? I mean, what, if there's con great confusion, if the science is so poor, if you have many different still variations, how does the average person dig through this and have a sensible diet, uh, keep their weight in control? What do they do? What's the, what's the path to, to sort of a, a healthy lifestyle? They have to cook more. Sorry? They have to cook more. Uh -huh. You need to go out and buy food and get back in touch with your food and not get swayed every time the scientists switch their mind and go out and buy the latest, greatest food product because they don't work. So we've become so disconnected with our food and it's such a complicated problem. It's going to require some policy because some of these things um, are beyond our control. So we are, some of us are addicted to food and literally can't stop. What was that old Lay's potato chip ad? You can't eat just one. It's true, they know you can't eat just one. They had test panels and they made it addictive. If you read David Kessler's book, and it's not your brother, is it? Um, no? Okay, anyway. <laughs> David Kessler from the ADA who identified the addictive uh, properties of nicotine has gone on to write a book called The End of Overeating and he's gone around the world to see all the evidence for food addictions, which he covers in chapter after chapter. One, I think, is called fat, salt, and sugar. One is called sugar, salt, and fat. One is called fat, sugar, salt, sugar, fat, fat, sugar, salt. <laughs> and his whole point is that the food industry is relying on us to be confused and manipulating our taste buds so that we eat more calories. Okay, back to you. What about these populations that I keep mentioning that didn't have the opportunity to eat more calories? So it didn't matter how addictive their food may or may not have been, their total amount was capped by the availability of food in their environment. Why were they obese? We would have to go back. There's a lot of complex things. If you look at those Icarians that eat a plant-based, low-fat diet, their whole culture evolves so many different uh, factors that would impact this. So our, our bigger issue is helping people, Americans, well, it's becoming global now, to lose weight. And I will agree, I mean, actually one of the more interesting publications that's come out lately is in developing countries, there's a simultaneous rise in malnutrition and obesity in the same populations. So I do agree that something is there and part of it's the Western diet. Well, again, but, but that, you can see that combination as early as 1928. But so, and part of this is, so what were they eating? Was there only a tuber around that provided almost all their calories and nothing else? Which may be the part where we get into this. There's carbs, uh, insulin puts away your carb. If you have, if you're continually challenging your system, your insulin level goes higher and higher, you become insulin res resistant, it goes higher and higher and higher, and then you're diabetic. And that would parallel some of this rise in obesity and diabetes that you're talking about. So it is one important factor, but I think it's being overplayed here. Yeah, the difference is, see, I'm a huge believer in Occam's razor, okay, which is never simplify, never complicate hypotheses beyond necessity. So this is a fundamental tenet of all science. It's what we need to make progress. And one thing that's happened in obesity, and in what you have to understand, the argument I'm making in my books is that prior to World War II in Europe, where all the major clinical medical research was done, actually all of the best science in the world pre-World War II was done in, science, in Europe. And when I was writing about physics, in which I started my career, the physicists used to say the best thing that ever happened to American science was Hitler, because he chased all these brilliant Europeans with their culture of science to the US and to Israel, and that's why these universities, these countries have such great science in specific fields. But pre-World War II in Europe, obesity was perceived as a hormonal regulatory disorder. Not a energy balance disorder, not an eating too much disorder, not a food addiction disorder, but literally a hormonal regulatory defect. Um, all of that was lost with the war, and I document this in my books. It was fascinating. The lingua franca of science went from being German to English pre-post-war. And in nutrition and public health, we simply stopped citing the German literature. And I say, imagine what would happen in physics if we decided that none of the physics done pre-World War II was important. We didn't have to pay attention to Heisenberg because he was a Nazi with his silly uncertainty principle and, and you know, any of these guys with their accents. And literally, this is what happened in medicine and public health and nutrition. 
So the post-war understanding of obesity as a hormonal regulatory defect was replaced pre-war with the simplistic idea of obesity as gluttony and sloth, energy balance. And everything went off the rails from there. And so today what we have is this idea that obesity is a complex multifactorial disorder. If you think of it in terms of trying to understand the solar system, if you think that the sun rotates around the earth instead of vice versa, or you think that the orbits of the planets have to be perfect circles, this is what historians of science, philosophers of science would call epicycles. We have to keep complicating everything to make, to somehow understand what we're seeing. But one very simple possibility is that when we lost this concept of obesity as a hormonal regulatory disorder and replaced it with obesity as an eating disorder, by the 1960s, the major figures in obesity research were psychologists. And imagine any other, imagine if diabetes was treated by psychologists, how many dead diabetics we'd have. <laughs> and yet this is what we did with obesity. And so by today, we have all these ideas, it's a cultural thing, it's a food addiction thing, it's a, you know, there are complex cultural factors. Whereas you have somebody who's walking around with 200 pounds of excess growth on his body. In any sane world, this would be perceived as a growth defect. Like if somebody walked in the store right now and he was eight feet tall, you wouldn't think about all the complex things that made him eat that much. You, if you were a physician, you'd think that fellow had a tumor in his pituitary gland and he's over secreting growth hormone. And even if he weighs 500 pounds, we don't care. We know the cause. It's a simple hormonal defect. But if his twin brother walks in and he's five foot 10 and weighs 500 pounds, we're going to blame it on eating too much, the addictive nature of food, the culture in which he grew up, the fact that he wasn't on this Greek island. <laughs> and the argument is, you know, simplest possible hypothesis. It is conceivable. Now, most people argue this. Amateurs like myself are wrong. Usually we're quacks who say, look, the establishment missed everything. And that's the real difficult thing is how do you tell, you know, how do you tell whether I'm a quack or not? I mean, all quacks sound reasonable. How, how do you tell? I'm going to ask Chris in a second. Yeah. Anyway, but the, 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 the fundamental argument here is that when we lost the pre-World War II learning, how many obesity, are there any obesity researchers in the audience? One, two. Do you guys, did the names Carl von Norden mean anything to you? Um, Louis Newberg? Oh, you read my book, OK. Um, <laughs> There are figures pre-World War II who are the equivalent of the Heisenbergs and the Bohrs and the Dirac's and you know, major figures in European medicine who have just been, their careers have been forgotten. It's been blanked out, like a 50-year period that's been erased from the medical public health. And what I'm saying is if you bring this back, then you end up with, if obesity is a hormonal regulatory defect, then it's the carbohydrate content of the diet that's driving it through this hormone insulin. It should have been solved in the 1960s when we worked out the accumulation that insulin regulates the accumulation of fat and fat cells for all intents and purposes. And we have a simple hypothesis. It doesn't mean that every individual will be able to reverse 30 or 40 years of metabolic disturbance by removing the carbs from the diet. But it does mean that if we never started eating these foods, which are in the processed foods that Chris is talking about, we would never have these obesity, this issue to deal with. This epidemic would never have happened. It could be right, it could be wrong, and it can be tested. And one of the things I'm hoping to do is get this tested through this not-for-profit we founded. But it's a simple argument and, it, you know, there's very few epidemics in the history of <coughs> modern medicine that aren't caused by simple cure. You know, lung cancer, cigarettes. It's not cigarettes and cultural issues. It's tobacco. And so it's not that out of the question that this doesn't have a simple cause. Christopher, I'm going to give you for this portion, and then we're going to take questions yeah. from the audience, the final word. Okay, so first, I want to applaud you in all your writing. You have done this amazing investigative work of all of history and pulled lots of things together. You really have a very rational hypothesis, absolutely. And it's compelling and it's fascinating that you are revered and vilified for what you're doing. And you're vilified by some of the people that you've scared that have banked on the low fat thing working and you're revered by the folks who thought they were wrong. Let me turn this into something a little more simple because a lot of your history 
there's a lot of complexity to it, the culture that you found these observations in. I'm going to give you, the head of NUSI, um, $80, $800 million to run this study. You ready? Okay, the average person's diet is 2,500 calories, higher for men than women, but let's say average 2,500. I want a, two caloric regimens, 1,500 a day or 3,500 a day. You should lose weight, I think, on 1,500. You should gain weight on 3,500. Hang on. Now, there's two, di two caloric levels, but there's two diets. One is uber low fat and one is uber low carb. Okay, and they're both going to be about 20% protein. We can argue that the one that's the higher fat will have more protein, but protein never gets with real food much higher than 30%. So keep the protein fairly constant. Two low-cal diets, one uber low carb, one uber low fat. Two high fat, two high calorie diets. Same difference. Now there's another level of who's insulin resistant or not, but forget that for the moment. On the four diets, who gains weight and who loses weight? Actually, that's a very good question, Chris, and thank you for not answering the how do we know if I'm a quack or not question that was raised earlier. No, this depends me, on how you answer it. No, let me. <laughs> That's why I asked. Um, and I'll tell you that the problem with that diet right now, see, what we want to test is this hypothesis that obesity is caused by positive energy balance, by eating too much, or is it a hormonal regulatory defect that in turn causes positive energy balance? So if I start driving calories into your fat, if I had a drug, a magical drug that could make you fatter, excuse me, um, and I give you this drug, and you start accumulating fat in your fat tissue, and by the way, are there any type 2 diabetics in, in here? Okay, you probably know what this drug is, because we have one. It's called insulin. Um, <laughs> if you start expanding your fat tissue because we've changed the hormonal milieu in which your fat tissue is living to it so it's now accumulates being told to take up fat and it's doing it you will then start you will then move into positive energy balance so you're now taking in more calories than you expend and see the problem with your hypothesis is you are um, your, your study is you're assuming off the get-go that if we make people eat a thousand calories more doesn't matter what, the, constant, what the, the dietary composition is, they're going to get fatter. And if we make them eat 1,000 calories less, doesn't matter what the dietary composition is, they're going to get, um, they're going to get leaner. But how much they want to eat is also biologically regulated. Okay, and it's going to be regulated. Think of growing children. This is the example that the pre-World War II Germans and Austrians used. When a child's going through a growth spurt, right? How many of you have young kids? Okay, they eat voraciously, right? And they lie around the house all day long. <laughs> okay, so growth is a side effect. So, they, you know, it's not that, and this is how the Europeans put it. They said the kids don't grow because they're eating voraciously or lying around the house all day long. They're eating voraciously and lying around the house. Their gluttony and sloth is a side effect of their drive to growth. And the growth is caused by a hormonal, you know, they... Uh, uh, growth hormone secretion that's stimulating insulin-like growth factor, that's driving them to grow. The same thing could be happening with their fat tissue. But their appetite is going to respond. And if you have small kids, again, this is anecdotal, but sometimes the kids are going through growth spurts, they eat everything you give them and more, and then complain that they're hungry, and sometimes they're not going through growth spurts, or so it seems, and they eat only half of what you give them and then wander off to watch SpongeBob. Um, Here's the experiment I would do. This is the first experiment. This is that not fair. I asked you to tell me what's going to happen in my experiment. He but said I, I get I, to go last, I and I gave you my question. I don't think your experiment is physiologically reasonable, and we don't actually know what will happen. Well, they're going to ask us questions. I would argue that on 35, again, you can argue that on the 1,500 calorie a day diets, uh -huh. okay, people might lose weight, but then their energy expenditure you know, you're semi-starving people, and we know that when we semi-starve either lean or obese people, their energy uh -huh. expenditure will come down. Oh, yeah. Some people, remember the 3,500 calories a day mimics the Claude Bouchard experiment, but without the variation on, um, on dietary composition. Which, and the interesting thing is, because the experiment I would like to describe to you, if I get a few minutes, is, we're going to we're gonna go yeah, to questions. It's an experiment that I described at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center that Claude Bouchard runs. And Claude Bouchard told us what he thought would happen in that experiment, and I would like to tell that story if I could. 
Um, but again, so you don't know. The question is, you're assuming off the get-go. I don't like the experimental design, so as the co-founder of NUSI, we're not going to spend the $800 million on I was giving you the $800 million. That was part of the deal. Well, we're refusing it because we have a better way to spend it. Okay. okay. I'm going to interrupt right now, and we're going to go to questions from the audience. Thank you for a great discussion. Thank you. I've been, I've been curious. I've been curious since we started. Is there fructose in that drink? No, this is pure black coffee, half decaf, so I don't flip out halfway through that. We're going to go right here to, there is a microphone coming to you. Hi, thank you so much. That was great. Um, so I read a couple months ago this study that said once you get to a certain weight and then you try to come down, your body now thinks it's starving. So if you got to that weight to begin with, the um, dieting or cutting down your or increase cutting down your energy intake is going to be harder and harder because the heavier you were to begin with, the more your body thinks it's starving. It's absolutely true. It's a simple thing. Your resting energy expenditure goes down. It thinks you're starving. It's trying to compensate and be more efficient. And if you want to lose that weight, you shouldn't be thinking six months. You should be thinking three years minimum. So how long did it take someone to put on that weight? They didn't put it on in six months. It's not coming off in six months. If it does come off in six months, it's going to come right back on because your body's going to work against you and make it harder and harder. Every extra pound you lose is going to make it that much harder to lose the next pound. So I like a term that somebody's used. We have a term called set point, and you may have reset your set point. I can't remember who said this, but there's another one called settling point. So you have settled up there. And if you want to resettle at a lower rate, it will take a lot of time. It's not simple. Um, and this is, again, we have two competing paradigms here. So what you just heard is sort of the conventional wisdom explanation for what happens when people get fatter. So the idea is we don't really know why you got fatter, but once you get that higher weight, Again, if you lose weight, your energy expenditure is in part uh, determined by your body mass, your surface area, so it goes down and you have to compensate. The argument that we've made is that the weight gain is driven by the carbohydrate content of the diet. And the problem is most people, when they lose weight, they go on low-calorie, low-fat diets. It's a traditional way of doing it. And so when you do that, you, in effect, starve yourself. And I just said, if we starve lean individuals, they'll have the exact same response which is their metabolic expenditure will go down even before they lose any significant weight. This was shown back in 1917. Okay, so the question is, why is it, if you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 pounds overweight, you are in energy balance if you're weight stable. So what you want to know is why are you in energy balance at 100 pounds overweight or 50 pounds overweight? Because it doesn't matter, whatever weight you are, and you could call it your set point, if you try to semi-starve yourself, you will lose weight. Now if you flip your paradigm, so that the problem, the reason you're fatter is because of the carbohydrate content of the diet and its effect on this hormone insulin. So instead of putting you on a low fat, low calorie diet, and a low fat diet keeps the carbs kind of constant, okay, probably improves the quality of the carbs, we're going to put you on a very low carbohydrate diet. And you can eat as many calories as you want. So this is classically an Atkins diet. And one of the reasons the medical community has such trouble embracing this is because we've thought of Atkins as a quack for so long, we don't like to think otherwise. But now we have a, a diet that's arguably triggered just to mobilize fat from your fat tissue. When you lower insulin levels, this is in the textbooks, you mobilize fat from your fat tissue and you oxidize that fat. Okay, you burn it for fuel. So that's the only thing you want to do. You want to get insulin as low as possible. Now, in theory, you can lose weight and your energy expenditure will go up, okay? The opposite of what Chris decided. And this can be tested. And in fact, this past summer, David Ludwig and, and uh, his colleagues from the Harvard Medical School published a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association where they did just this. They semi-starved people, overweight, obese subjects, so that they lost, I think it was 10% of their fat mass. Mm -hmm. And then they measured their energy expenditure. And they randomized them to three diets where they kept, they gave them, matched their intake exactly to their expenditure. So calories in are equal to calories out. One was a low-fat diet. One was a low glycemic index diet, which is lower in carbohydrates, and the carbohydrates in them are less refined, a higher quality. And one was a very low fat, arguably an Atkins diet. 
matched energy expenditure to intake. So if you believe it's all about calories, then you believe that these people's weight won't change and their intake, their expenditure won't change. And what they found, they only did it, they did it for months at a time. So it's a very short period. But the fewer the carbohydrates in the diet, the greater the energy expenditure. So in the Atkins-like diet, energy expenditure went up three or 400 calories despite these people maintaining a weight-reduced state. So the argument would be, if what I'm arguing is right, if this carbohydrate, insulin, hormonal defect hypothesis is correct, the reason that you see the uh, uh, reduction in energy expenditure on the typical diet when people lose weight is because that diet is the wrong diet. It's a low, ca it's a low calorie, low fat, high carbohydrate diet. If they merely removed the cause of the obesity, the carbohydrates, then you wouldn't see that reduction in expenditure. And it's actually one of the things that we are going to be testing with this nutrition science initiative with the money we have been given. Because if we can demonstrate, as David Ludwig arguably already did, but we'll do it in a much more rigorous, well-controlled manner, if we can demonstrate that people can lose weight while their en energy expenditure goes up, it's contrary to one of the fundamental tenets of the obesity, sort of our understanding of obesity. Christopher, let me give you a minute before we go to another question to respond. Just yeah, respond you meant quickly. lose weight while your energy intake goes up, not as your energy expenditure no, goes up. No, energy expenditure will, well, actually, that arguably, one of the interesting okay. experiments I've always wanted to do is to- All right, no, 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 I get to go now. All right. You, you have let's long to, answers. Let's go to another question over here. What do you think about, um, Types of carbs, you mentioned the rice paradox uh, in Eastern Asia, and also um, whether the glycemic index of carbs matters as opposed to the total amount of carbs. It's a great question. And I'm working on a carbohydrate pyramid. I know the, the pyramid's out of fashion now. We have my plate. But just because it's so ingrained in a lot of people's heads, uh, I'd love some feedback here. So in my carbohydrate pyramid, the bottom of my carbohydrate period pyramid is legumes and leafy greens. And then after that is some whole fruits. And then after that is some whole grains. So really the wheat berries, not the bread. And some pasta and some rice, especially brown rice. And after that is white bread and white donuts and white bagels. And after that is fruit juice and sugar and candy. And I think part of the issue is, and I think Gary would agree to some extent here, if we lopped off the top of that pyramid in our diet, you're getting at the quality of the carbohydrate. And the biggest portion of our diets right now in carbs is really simple, poor quality carbs. And, and in that regard, we would both agree. So Gary's right, in this trial that we're doing right now, both groups, the low fat and the low carb, have wiped out all fruit juice, all sugar, all Coke, all simple carbs, all white bread, all white rice. And both groups eat a lot of vegetables. And when we do that on both groups, some people lose weight on both diets and some lose no weight. So your answer might be right for her if we figured out how insulin resistant you were or not. We just have seven minutes left, so yeah, I'm um, to get to more questions. You know, Chris said I do basically agree with it, but the issue is that you could look at it as there, there are several things we're looking at in the quality of the carbohydrates in the diet. So how quickly they're digested the quantity of carbs and how quickly they're digested. So the green vegetables have actually very few digestible carbohydrates in them, and that carbohydrate is bound up with fiber. So it's very slowly digested. It has a low glycemic index. Then you have the sugar content. So how much fructose is in it is another issue, which doesn't reflect in glycemic index, but is also important. And then there could be other issues like gluten and glycoproteins and breads that are less well um, our, you know, we just don't really know about how serious and how widespread that problem is. But the fundamental difference, like if everyone ate, um, if we went back in time 150 years and we all ate Chris's carbohydrate pyramid and we lopped off the top, I think we'd be a wonderfully healthy population. Actually, I wonder, what would we die of if I'm blaming heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and everything on these, the top of the pyramid we just lopped off? The problem is we've been eating these foods for a long time. So now if you're obese, overweight, type 2 diabetic, can you, is it enough to lop off the top of the pyramid? 
and eat at the base of the pyramid? Or do you have to perhaps minimize it all? And one of the, th I, I come back to a single anecdotal observation in the 1950s by a researcher who arguably should have been perceived as like the Einstein of obesity. And instead it was also forgotten. And he was a doctor at DuPont who was putting obese diabetic, obese DuPont executives on a, effectively an all meat diet with a, some green vegetables. And he said he had one obese DuPont executive who lost 50 pounds effortlessly, but if he ate a single apple a day, his weight loss stopped. And I have no reason to doubt that that was true. And so the question is, if you're already, if you're overweight or obese, since we're talking about two separate issues, what causes obesity both in individuals on a population-wide level, which is the top of that pyramid, and what you have to do to be as healthy as possible once you've become metabolically disturbed by the top of that pyramid being in your population and your diet and your mother's diet and her mother's diet for a hundred some odd years and what you now have to do to be as healthy as possible, which are two different things. In the second case, the whole pyramid, except for the base, the green leafy vegetables, could be problematic, even the wonderful wheat berries. And, legumes. and we don't know. We do not know what the Okay, we're going to take a question over here. Do studies show or not show a difference in caloric intake between obese and non-obese people? Ah, that's fascinating. Um, often not, so part of, but part of it is energy expenditure, something that Gary was alluding to. So if you've changed your diet, have you changed, does that cause you to change your physical activity, not physical activity, changing your weight? So do you, be, do you become more sedentary? So it's really complicated to track the different pieces down. So part of it is digesting your food, that's a tiny part. Part of it is just what it takes for your heart and lungs to work all day long. And part of it is your physical activity, which is the most variable between people and the hardest to measure. And we're also horrible at measuring how many calories you eat. Unless we stick you in these really contrived places where you can't leave and there's a camera on you and we feed all your food. And that's not really the general population. So if you tell us what you eat, as honest and scientific as you are, you will mislead us unintentionally. And trying to tie the calories you took in to the calories you expended is so crude that it looks like in many cases the obese are eating the same amount as the lean, but there's wiggle room for error. Even if they're not, here's the point. If I suddenly gain 50 pounds um, for whatever reason, so instead of being 215, I'm now 265 pounds, I have a larger body to move around, I have more surface area, I am going to expend more energy than I did at 215, and I have to say I'm relatively sedentary now, so it's hard to imagine that I will be less sedentary, um, or more, more sedentary. But the point is, um, so I'm going to want to eat more because my expenditure is greater. And so if you look at the curves as best we can tell, as, as Chris said, it's very hard to measure these things, but curves of intake versus um, expenditure, they overlap between lean and obese people. The interesting thing is the people in the middle where it overlaps, so you could have, and again, there was a study done in the uh, 1930s where they looked at this, how much energy people expended, women. And there are women who weighed 107 pounds who expended the same amount of energy as women who weighed 180 pounds. So if their weight's stable, they would be taking in the same amount of calories, and yet they'll be in energy balance at 70 pounds different. So one of the arguments that I've been making is that this paying attention to how much people are eating and exercising is not what you should be doing. What we have here is a disorder of fat accumulation. Okay, people are overweight and obese, have too much fat. You should be paying attention. Who cares how much they eat and exercise? Just as a growing child, you don't care how much they eat and exercise. You care that they're growing because, you know, so what you want to do is study the hormonal enzymatic regulation, central nervous system regulation of their fat tissue and pay attention to that. And if and you do that, you'll solve the problem. If you pay attention to eating and exercise, you won't. I really want to reframe that for 10 seconds. Part of my argument for them maybe not eating so differently is that obese get victimized, and that's not fair. Some of this is really beyond their control. They're not overeating. They're not slothful. They are really frustrated, and we are not doing enough to help them. And that's, I had a conversation yesterday with a reporter from Vogue, where the intention is you tend to think like there's this obese population out there that's eating at McDonald's every day, and they should know better. But they're not. They're all around us. They're our friends and our relatives and ourselves, and they're doing, they are trying just as hard as every lean person, and probably harder 
Because if you're lean, you could usually eat whatever you want. Probably harder, and the discrimination yeah. is uh, extraordinary. Over here, one last question. Listening to you two is warring factions. Um, I'm wondering if we can come to um, common ground that you two share. And what I'm hearing from you, and correct me if I'm wrong in summarizing where you might have common ground, one is my favorite phrase, eat your fruit, don't drink it. So mm -hmm. perhaps the elimination of all juice. And two is decreasing our amount of fluffy white carbohydrates. So the other is pushing, I believe in the plate model, where only a quarter of your plate should be carbohydrate, half of the plate should be fruits and vegetables, and a quarter of it protein. How valid do you feel that is? And then I just watched a movie and I'm a carnivore, but I just watched Forks and Knives and the China study, and that has just totally flipped me out. So I would love to hear your comment on that. Oh, you really don't want to get into the China study. There's actually a, a lot of assumptions that, that may not be true, and he's filling in some blanks between the science. I would say Let's Gary talk and about I agree common on ground. This, in the, in yeah, the, wrap up the common, common ground, the pyramid that I described, which isn't a real pyramid. I hope you understand that I'm making this pyramid up. A <laughs> carbohydrate pyramid. There's no meat or dairy or anything in it. It's really the carbs. Gary and I would totally agree on the top section. And then as we move to the white bread and the fruit juice, as Sonia said, we would keep agreeing and then we would start to divert. So our common ground is the amount of calories that come from high fructose corn syrup, sugar, refined carbs, breakfast cereals. I mean, it's ubiquitous. Donuts, bagels, everywhere. And it's served all the time. Mary Nestle's favorite line for me is we eat more places, more frequently, and larger portions. And the simplest things that stay well are breads. They don't really go mold. They're easy to put out, donuts, bagels, those things. So if we're eating them more frequently in more places in our car, I bet we would agree there. Um, we do, but remember, I'm concerned about those populations that didn't, didn't have the opportunity to eat frequently more places and still had high levels of obesity. Um, so yeah, we agree on this carbohydrate pyramid. I think a fundamental error you're making with this plate, and I don't know what you do, but to assume that every, you know, what we have, I mean, you could imagine, I just did a thought experiment on my, my, and my seasonal blog entry. I get around to blogging about once every three months. And I just said, let's assume we have identical twins. And they, we put them in our laboratory and we measure their energy expenditure and we find out they're each expending 2,500 calories a day and then we feed them identical diets except 300 calories are from sugar in one diet, and the other twin gets those 300 calories from glucose or from fat. And then because it's a thought experiment, we could keep them in our laboratory for 20 years and run it out and end up, are they gonna have the exact same body types? Are they gonna still be identical after 20 years where the only difference in their diet is at 300 calories of sugar versus, and you could do the same thing with the population. You could imagine we have two identical populations. We have 5,000 identical twins, and half of them live in one village, and the other, their siblings live in the other village, and we feed them the exact same diets, but 300 calories are from sugar in one village and not the other. We're going to have the same number of obese and diabetic subjects. And the answer is, I don't think we will. Okay, I think that one change, independent of calories, is going to have a significant difference on how they evolve and how it affects their health. And for all I know, the sugar people, the sugar industry would say the sugar group might be healthier. And that's, but the point is, you can't assume that something like you can turn and say, look, here's this person who's 100 pounds overweight. They have been eating exactly like you have. OK? Exactly. The problem is, whatever it is, something in that diet made them fat. It wasn't because they went to McDonald's any more than you did. It wasn't that they ate more white bread than you did. It's a diet you can eat keeps you relatively lean. The diet they eat makes them fat. The same food. So you can't say, I love the my plate. It should be a quarter carbs. There should be this much fruit, this much vegetable, because that could be a perfectly healthy diet for 60% of the population, and 40% it'll keep them fat or make them fatter. And one of our problems with government guidelines is we don't differentiate. So we say we should all eat fruit. You know, and fruit, I don't, I don't, I, I think, you know, basically Chris and I agree on everything. If we were all a lean population, the only thing we'd disagree on are some ethical issues about meat eating. And I haven't seen forks versus knives, so maybe if I watch it, I'd swing. But we don't have a healthy population anymore. And so what the ob overweight, obese, diabetic, population eats is may not be the same 
you know, the same thing that a lean person eats and tolerates is likely to make them fat or keep them fat. We're going to wrap up. I'm going to, we're going to lunch afterwards. I'm going to be really watching what these guys <laughs> order. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.